Hi, my name is Max Hurden, and this is Uncommon. Uncommon is a production by Neural, an agency that helps both brands and talent tell their story. To learn more, just visit neural.com. That's N E U R A L L E.com. My guest this week, Max Hurden, founder of Megaphone, co founder of Sylvie. Um, and someone who I recently met at, uh, must have been the July opening, I think, uh, at least their new studio space. Um, how's living in the forest going? Yeah, it's been good. Uh, so I spend only a few days of the month there, but yeah, it's, I bought it um, during lockdown and it's been an awesome getaway, place to kind of think, recharge. Yeah, uh, I love it. Do you, which part of Melbourne is it? Uh, it's called uh, Menzies Creek. It's kind of in the Dandenongs. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Because it looked very similar to the Dandenongs. It's so funny. Your story, listening to that video on your YouTube channel about that is very similar to my mate who we went out there Sunday night, a whole group of us to, to hang out, have dinner, all that sort of stuff. And they literally had the same reasoning. They were near Monbolk. Monbolk? Yeah. Monbilk? Yeah. 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 I know it. It's, so, it's fucking beautiful out there. Absolutely beautiful. You know, I didn't even know. It's, it's like less than an hour away. And the change of scenery is so dramatic where it's just so thick and lush uh, and you're on a dirt road. And I didn't realize that was less than an hour away from where I was. So, yeah, it just shows how much more of Melbourne there is to kind of explore. Yeah, and we're kind of lucky in that regard. I mean, if you look at Sydney, um, it's very hard to experience something like that because the city is so vast because of the way that it's structured. But yeah, I think um, areas like the Dandenongs and even sort of regional cities like Ballarat offer people a lot, of the, a lot of that stuff. But, you know, it's been an interesting year. I think this time right now we're recording, it's the 26th of May and um, we're probably about to go potentially through another lockdown. So it'll be intriguing to see what that does as a second round or really a third round <laughs> for people here in Melbourne and, and Australia. I've got to ask, it was intriguing to listen back to some of these early interviews you've done. Everyone's got this trope of calling you sort of like the Tim Ferriss of Australia, which I find very funny. Um, but I was curious about your childhood because uh, you seem to be a na- naughty kid. So what's sort of your earliest memory of being naughty? Yeah, you, you've done your research. Jeez, uh, so many. I mean, the famous story in my childhood, which I don't know if I'm should be proud of it or ashamed of it. Um, I got sent to Sunday school, and I was I was really naughty in school, and I was even more naughty in Sunday school. I just, I just there was there was a lack of respect for the teachers, and I just didn't want to be there, and I wanted to entertain my friends, and I was very into prank calling. So every recess, I would prank call, and our go-to was trolley trackers, which would be when you lose a trolley, you call them up. And then they come collect the trolley and we pranked them so frequently that they just stopped answering our calls. They'll just instantly hang up. And during the recess, we're like, well, what other free numbers can we call from this payphone? And we're like, oh, fire brigade. So prank called the fire brigade. We all had a good laugh, went back to class. And then five minutes later, four or five fire trucks rock up at Sunday school and didn't realize it was a prank, obviously. And I was like six or seven or like really young. Wow. Um, and so they came in, they knocked on all the doors. I admitted to it. Um, yeah. And, and then my, I didn't tell my parents for two weeks. And then I found out because I was talking back to the teacher a few weeks later. And then that plus that, you know, everything accumulated and grounded for a long time. But yeah, that was just one of the many silly things I did in my childhood. Because wow. that, that fire thing would have been interesting because you get charged for a call out if it's, if it's fake. Um, totally. At least, yeah. at least these days. I don't know if it was it was the same back then, um, but yeah, that's. I, I had a similar thing. I think there's a lot of similar elements of our personalities, and being naughty or challenging things as a kid was the same thing for myself. Prank calls was my thing. Um, so it started, good. It started with the kids' helpline, and then proceeded to like takeaway stores and just everything. Um, yeah, you know, which in hindsight. Um, None of it very politically correct, but it doesn't really matter when you're eight, nine years old. You just do anything. Totally. And you're just, yeah, trying to make my friends laugh. And that's, that's it. Every, it? Yeah. 
every slumber party, I'd be like, okay, we need to get Max to do the prank call. And it was kind of like my little like party trick where I was very good on the fly and, you know, I could make something funny out of nothing. Um, yeah, we used to record them actually and send them around school. And later I actually had a radio show and every week I'd do a prank call on the radio show as well. So yeah, definitely something I've done a lot of. <laughs> do you, do you have a particular character that you had for these pranks? Uh, so in, at uni, when I had the, um, radio show, there was a character I did called psychic Sam, where I would call up as a psychic and, and give them a reading. And I'd be like, okay, uh, hi Jordan. Uh, I'm going to give you a reading today. Uh, are you interested in getting a free psychic reading? And they'll say no. And then I'd be like, I'm getting a reading that you are. So I'm going to go ahead and continue. And then I would just, you know, try to guess things about their life really poorly. And that was one of my gimmicks. Um, <laughs> another one was pretending to be a celebrity's manager and then continually doing more and more silly requests. Um, you know, I'd be like, this is guy Sebastian's manager and we need a book a table, but we need some requests. Uh, yeah. I don't know. All kinds of stupid things. Yeah. What about yourself? For me, it was, um, I can't really remember to be honest. One thing I can do in terms of impersonations is sort of like an old lady voice, like doggy, uh, yeah. a sweater. like, you know, yeah. uh, the, the family guy, um, lady, I would always do that. Or, uh, Oftentimes when like my staff call me, I'll just like answer in that old voice just to trick them a bit, um, keep them on their toes. Yeah. So sort of like an old lady persona was a thing. Um, I used to have this Indian guy that I I would always use um, because that was sort of the, when I was doing prank calls, it was like the heyday of um, like crank yankers and stuff like that. Yeah. I watched Um, it. Yeah. So I don't know. It was, it's a bit of everything. Now, when you were a kid, what did you think you were going to be when you grew up? So when I was really little, I used to say that I wanted to be a bank, not a banker, but a bank, um, just because that's where all the money went to. And it just seemed like a lucrative job. Um, for a while, I was interested in basketball. So that was a big interest of mine and, and law. Um, but I really don't, you know, everything that I was interested in, and it wasn't really for good reasons. It was just like, Oh, people seem to respect lawyers and, you know, lawyers seem to have nice things, but it, it wasn't really a well thought out plan on what I wanted to do. So, and as I started to do some of those things, I realized that I really didn't like it. So I was definitely a little bit confused entering uni, figuring out what I was going to do in my life. Well, what did your parents do? Um, they both did uh, science degrees and then they both ended up working for the government for, for a while as well. Okay. So were you one of those people who thought, okay, I just definitely don't want to do that? I guess maybe just because it looked a bit too stifling. Um, And, you know, I wasn't really, I dreaded corporate life. And I remember going into my careers fair at university and just looking into the eyes of the grads and I'd be like, are you happy at your job? And I just didn't get a sense that they were. And I just got a sense that something was being sucked out of their life a little bit, you know, maybe it's just because I was so resistant to it. Um, I've only had one job in my entire life and I didn't enjoy it. And everyone there was so happy. And it was kind of a signal to me that jobs are probably not for me in, in many ways and particularly corporate jobs as well. You know, school wasn't necessarily a great system for me. Um, and then corporate life seemed even potentially more, more challenging for, for me. So it definitely was a motivation to try to figure out something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a similar thing as a kid in that I I worked at my dad's factory and I just knew that I didn't want to be in that world. But, you know, in a classic case of uh, having a walk background, he's like, you know, you've got to do a profession. For me, it was like, okay, what's he good at? Accounting, finance, that sort of stuff. And I get into that area and I just sort of similar to yourself. I, I really actually, when I did my grad role, I fucking hated it. Like I really dreaded it. Um, I just remember having that feeling of dread going into work in the in during this whole graduate period. I was lucky I actually made a friend with someone who who owns a business as well, who was sort of like the associate above me. Um, so at least I had that. I had that individual who had the, a similar thing. But yeah, I can imagine going to those fairs. What it would be like to see that as well. Um, I know you graduated, so you graduated from Monash 2011. I think you did a similar degree to myself, actually. Bachelor of Commerce and Economics, Marketing, Finance, Economics sort of area seems to be the major. An early gig sort of seems like you at least would have learned to sell at Apple, um, working there as a specialist. 
I know you were playing in a band probably at the same time wearing those red jeans. The first, <laughs> in, the first industry gig, which is probably what you were talking about, was um, this role as a social media, social marketing coordinator. But then also you were sort of playing on the side with this uni party listings business. Um, during that period of time, if you look back on that era, what seems like the greatest principles that you pulled into, into what became Megaphone? So I think with uni party listings, um, I just loved partying in university mm. and it was hard to find good parties. And so it was definitely like feeling a need of my own. And then seeing that a lot of people were interested in that. Um, I think the the number one skill that kind of came out of that area was like resourcefulness, which I really think is like one of the core traits of entrepreneurship. You know, I was trying to grow a social media following um, with no money, uh, no budget, and no experience. So it was just like going on, you know, weird forums. Like, I don't know if you know, like Warrior Forum or Black yeah. Hat World and all of these different things and just reading everything that I could and then figuring out if there's like tools that you could leverage to kind of get an advantage and growing those successfully. And then that led to the next domino, which was doing the social media for a music festival and, and then ultimately starting a digital agency. But yeah, I think it was... Um, if you come up with a problem, then just being resourceful in, in finding the solution. And I think that was something, yeah, I really had to practice in that time. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Resourcefulness is sort of, uh, it's like the bread and butter of when you start out. You've got nothing. It's interesting to hear that. So you, you've been doing the uni party listing things and then you got pulled into, did you say it was a music festival? Yeah. So um, again, still didn't know what I wanted to do. And my brother knew someone that ran Strawberry Fields and connected me. Um, ah, and I did okay. an internship for free and then they knew that I was good at social media. They're like, Oh, can we pay you to do social media? Um, and you know, and I, I hit a lot of good metrics for them. Um, and I was just interested honestly in learning how that business ran. So I thought maybe I wanted to run a music festival or something, which still does seem like a pretty fun gig, although very stressful. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, I know you found a megaphone in uh, your bedroom at home still living at home with your parents. I think um, no doubt you would have been struggling in your mind about w what this actually is. You had this intern working alongside you. It sort of seems to me without realizing it, um, you, di like you, you did dive headfirst into Facebook and Google ads and so forth. Sort of around, it looks like it was 2012, 13. So you would have been consuming pretty much everything about it, like courses, blogs, videos, et cetera, which, it's kind of a constant theme in your life, it seems. Um, but I, I, w I wonder how early on you realized you were heading towards a sort of a, a speciality of performance marketing and, and ads. And then also, it seems, using those platforms in and of themselves to really build yourself as, as number one in that space. So Megaphone came uh, somewhat serendipitously. And it was just, you know, it was kind of the domino of what I'd done last or what I'd done last. And I kind of saw myself, if I did go down the entrepreneurship route, as doing tech. Like, and I, I was doing mm. like a, uh, you know, a few like software companies. And, but then I kind of got a few clients and another client. And then you're spot on. I just got obsessed with like learning. So I just did as many courses. And kind of one of my philosophies was like, if I do more courses than, and read more books and read more blogs than anyone else in Australia, then die by default you know, we'll become the best at what we do. Um, and so that was kind of my philosophy and I kind of enjoyed it. Um, it didn't, like the work felt like the, the calls and some, you know, the actual execution, but the learning kind of me felt pretty fun. Um, but yeah, it was, it was somewhat random that that's what I ended up doing. You know, I liked data. I liked creative, uh, you know, I'd always been interested in like drawing or, mathematics you know were like my two strongest things so it kind of made sense that you get to like make an ad and then you get to uh, analyze the data that um there'd be like something that i kind of gravitate towards and i and i also just like the problem solving um where you take a business and you know you've got an ex an, an outcome and i just i loved i love business I, you know i think it's just a you know business is like a hobby for me and so i was working for a gelati shop or an education company and I, and I just try to solve a problem for them. Mm. And so similar to back in the day where it's just like, okay, cool. They, they often these businesses at the start were very strapped for resources. 
and they had ambitious outcomes. And so I'd try to be like very creative in how I can get them some level of solution. Uh, and often it'd, it'd, it'd go out of social media as well, but I'd, my foot in the door to work with them was social media. How early did you realize that you sort of had this specialization and that that could give you a unique position in the market? Because uh, I asked this because I, when we first started out, we suffered from the thing that the, this guy, Dan Monheit, we've had on a few times, big owner of an independent agency, Hard Hat. I actually played basketball with him no many shit. years ago. That's Funnily so funny. Enough, yeah. Um, and he calls it the five A's where you do anything for anyone, anytime, any price, anywhere. And, you know, as a digital agency, we were doing that for ages, like web, SEO, mail, like just everything. And we've only really gotten to our specialization in the last uh, 12 months, I'd say, which has been uh, like monumental for me as an individual. So I wonder when it was for you that you started to realize that. Yeah, so I think you're spot on in saying like, I remember a website that I built for a client and charged them <laughs> 1,100 and I learned to code to get a bit of it done. Then I outsourced some of it for $800, probably worked like 200 hours to get this <laughs> website done. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I made nothing, but I was getting paid-ish to learn how to code and, and build a website. I wasn't like looking at the market and going, oh, where's the opportunity? I was like, what's getting clients results? And so if a client would speak to me and then I would just think, okay, with everything that I've learned, I've learned Google, I've learned social, you know, I've learned how to build websites. It's like, they've only got this amount of money to spend. So that equates to this amount of hours. How can I get them a result? And I think um, at the time, you know, the conversations I was having eight years ago was, yeah, I think this Facebook thing is going to be around, you, you know, I'd have to convince them that social media was here to stay. And uh, it wasn't like, it, you know, it's kind of funny to think, but I'd be like, but they'd be like, oh, well, my, you know, my son's not using Facebook anymore. And it's like, okay, cool. Well, a billion people are still using it every day. So it's, you know, I think it's, it's still a good platform. Um, so I'd have to actually know all the stats about the platform. But I think that that was kind of what I was approaching it. It was like, I don't really mind what platform I use. I just want to get the client results in an efficient manner and that just seemed to be the best opportunity um, and even as we've grown to be kind of being seen as like a facebook performance agency or whatever, whatever uh, we might have the strongest reputation if for whatever reason we didn't think facebook was the best opportunity then we'll just stop selling it so we're not committed to a specific service line we're just committed to results and whatever we think is the best opportunity and a result in your mind is essentially a sale yeah, yeah, exactly. That's it. You know, some level of return on investment. Yeah. So, I mean, after this initial period, um, I, I know there was a moment where you finally hired an extra set of hands for three days a week. After I think you were handling 17 clients on your own and doing everything. Um, yeah. And that hire probably helped you realize indirectly that that may actually be the most important activity in the business, not doing um, certain strategy work and, and so forth. And I know... I've come to I've come to personally learn in this business that more than anything, it's a people business. I think forty to fifty percent of your overhead is often, you know, staff salaries um, and the like. So for a refinement geek like yourself, I could see that understanding that and wanting to refine hiring would have been huge for you. So, how was that process initially, you know, to to drive scale, and then how has it changed to what hiring is like today? Yeah. So fundamentally, I think like, you know, if you're selling like, you know, with our pillowcase company, we're selling pillowcases, like our product is a pillowcase and it has to be something that you, that people love so much that they'll refer to a friend or whatever it is. And it's the same goes with your agency where you're selling people. And so your product is people. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to have amazing product, then you're going to have to have amazing people. And so there's kind of, there's kind of different stages of the business where there was like a key major problem to solve. And so, you know, the first one for most businesses is lead gen and then sales and then potentially first hire and operations. Um, but a major, a major issue in scale, particularly in this business is hiring. And, you know, it, it changes at different levels of the business, but we've thought a lot about hiring. So we think about how we can be positioned as one of the best places in Australia to work from culture to, you know, rewards and just kind of growth opportunity and 
uh, making a really good place and then trying to showcase how good our culture is. So that way we can be a magnet for the best talent. We spend a lot on ads as well. We use all different platforms from LinkedIn, Seek, pedestrian, you know, university boards, whatever it is, you know, we're now building out our hiring team, you know, then we actually launched in Sydney and Brisbane. So now we can triple the amount of applications that we can get. We've also launched in the US and we're running that team remote. So now we've got uh, more people that we can get. Uh, The other thing that we're challenged right now um, is how do we hire at a senior level consistently? And so if we can consistently hire people with five years experience that are really good and hit the ground running, that's going to be probably the next biggest thing in terms of our hiring hurdle to get from where we are now and double again. So yeah, hiring's always been something that we've thought a lot about. Um, we've got a very analytical process and we've had a unique process right from the start. Um, as we've scaled it, we're trying to make it more analytical as well so that we can be less biased um, and be more accurate with our hiring. What, what makes it unique? So right from the start, for no apparent reason, um, I thought it'd be cool that everyone that gets a job here has to do some level of a challenge. I remember actually hiring someone back in the day and the person didn't accept the job. Like this was when I was really early and I was thinking a few things. One is like this person didn't get a sense of what we were doing in our mission and what we stand for. And we almost made it too easy for them where we just said like, you know, here's the job. Cause it was like my second employee. Um, and it was like, there was no level of us qualifying this person properly and us doing our due diligence and, and explaining our mission and then having the chance to kind of express their attitude and their skill set. So we built in a challenge um, and the challenge is different depending on the role. But if you're an account manager, then you might have to create an ad and a campaign and you know a few A-B split tests based on a, you know, a client of your choosing. And the the... The, the range that we get in terms of different applications, we get some people that just go, yeah, I can do this and put it together in one hour. We get other people that do this nine page detailed analysis where they do like, you know, a review analysis and a sentiment analysis. And then they look at the ad library of every ad and they use a bunch of different tools. It's like, if that person is so more likely to uh, come in and bring in an amazing attitude to the role. And a lot of our top hires, like, and even just having then as that as a talking point in our final round interview to talk through the thought process, you know, even if they aren't tactically good because we're not necessarily hiring for the skill set, but do they have a really intelligent line of thought and how they've thought about that challenge? So that's always made our hiring process, I think, more accurate. Um, and then recently we've added in different aptitude testing as well. And so there's different, um, apt- like there's different, whether it's like a logical test or a numerical test or a verbal reasoning test, and we can see a correlation between the aptitude testing and performance as well. And now we're trying to put together a framework. We've also got a framework on personality testing as well, where we can be a little bit more analytical and say, hey, you know, we didn't actually think that this person was uh, a 10 out of 10, but they scored really good on these tests. So let's give them a chance. And those people have been really good. You know, when you're not sure or you're on the fence, the test can be a really good decider. and, And there's definitely been a strong correlation for us. And those personality tests are like sort of big five personality type tests, right? Yeah, we're using uh, testcandidates.com for, for no apparent reason. I looked at like four or five platforms and that was the one that, that I chose. That was the one. Uh, and the challenge you mentioned before, is that something that you get them to do during the recruitment process or when they first start and they get recruitment to recruitment process? A, a account? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, it's 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 definitely interesting. I could see how it, it would have been the thing that really scaled the business. I, I wonder as well, because this is something I've had to go through as an outsider to the industry, is adjusting different levers for efficiencies in the business that allow you to to scale better, like profitably, as opposed to just scaling for scaling sakes. Because, you know, we're in a business where it's all about cash flow. And essentially, you have to have the cash to put towards that individual who may not have, you know, it takes a month to maybe three at least to see some results from that person. So I do wonder, you know, one of the things we've had internally is billing efficiency. You know, it's it's something that I never really considered as an outsider, but, you know, my co-founder and wife is like, this is, this is standard in the industry. It doesn't have to be as intense as, say, the consulting firms. But that has been a big lever for us. Um, in terms of also working out what is a wa- often a waste of time in the long term in the business, things that just didn't have a real impact over a couple of months. 
So was there anything like that that you felt were also major levers in the business? So for that, um, you know, we had like a rough hourly rate that we're shooting towards and we made sure that there was some, if we wanted to work overtime on those hourly rate that we could make it affordable. There was also a relatively just decent analysis on the services that were most useful for the clients and the services that were most profitable for us. So like a lot of clients said, hey, we want help with our social media content, you know, which was a big thing back in the day. And I was just like, just get an intern, um, you know, get a uni student to do that for 25 bucks an hour. We'll have a call with them once a month and help them out. But you don't want to pay us $120 an hour to do your content, pay us $120 an hour to do your ads and your strategy and your funnel strategy and your CRO, like the stuff that's going to move the needle for you. And the good thing is then they don't look at the bill that's getting bigger and bigger and go, oh, we could actually just get someone else to do that. And so we, we kind of go, what are the highest expertise we can provide for this client? Um, and the things that are lower expertise, how can we help them build that internally? So um, we're more affordable and our time is more uh, profitable for us as well, because it's the most difficult stuff to kind of hand over as well. So that, that was kind of our strategy from the start. You, yes, you. Are you intrigued by this episode? If so, go to our footer on the website, N-E-U-R-A-L-L-E.com, neural.com. We're going to give you an insight each week. It's going to be on business, marketing, or a topic that we covered in the episode at all. We'd love your support and it would help us in developing the intellect around this series. But without going on too much longer, let's get back into this episode. So just run that through again with me. The, the lower expertise work is essentially the stuff you focus less on as an agency or at least making that more affordable with the higher expertise being the things that you guys double down on essentially. Yeah, that's it. That's it. And, and it's also like even helping them build that in internally so that they can do that without needing our help. You know, we can still do that stuff for them. Um, yeah. And some clients just want us done. It's also like we tried to move away from project-based work where possible because project-based work, I feel like people's expectations were higher. And again, like we can do these things for people if they want, but the profitability in our project work was lower. People's expectations was higher. Often it would bleed outside of the, the project. So where it made sense, we'd be like, cool, you want to get this done? Here's a partner. They'll do it for this price. We can do it if you want, but you know, we're only going to do it for you because we want to keep you as a long-term client on this, which is actually going to make you money. And it's the thing that we're the best at as well. So yeah. there was a little bit of an analysis on what are the things that make sense for us to kind of double down on. And yeah, I think it's, you know, it's the ones, it's the most complicated things, right? Like, you know, Facebook ads is, you know, although it's simple, anyone can run an ad. It's incredibly it's complex, complex. To, yeah. to think about strategy, you know, copy, a creative funnel, yeah. all that stuff. Um, and that's the more that we focus on that, then the more insights that we have in that, inter- that, that specific niche and that we can make a 50%, 100% uplift on your campaigns. And that's going to be the most useful for these clients anyway. Whereas if, you know, for their content, if we did it or someone else did it, it's not going to move the needle that much for them. Yeah, it reminds me of this. I, I was reading this book recently. Um, people can probably see that here if they're watching the video. It's called The Business of Expertise, David C. Baker. There's another guy, Blair Eanes, called, he wrote a book called Win Without Pitching and they got a podcast called Two Bobs. Um, it's fucking brilliant. It's just so smart and, and talks about these sort of things that you were, it seems like, in tune to. It is if you're an expert, you should be leaning more on that expert expertise and strategy component and less on the commoditized type of work that, that a lot of people can do or could be brought in house or like you said, doesn't really move the needle for clients. So I find, I find that interesting that you've sort of picked up on that naturally. Um, I was curious, what were the sort of services you dropped pretty quickly in the first um few years as you scaled the business was it like what else were you doing way back in the day like web development you mentioned were you doing seo and all that sort of stuff yeah so like and we still do a lot of those things as well now we've got like five or six web developers and we will give you a website if you need it you you know again like we don't we're not like trying to push website sales on people yeah if you really want a website and you want it all in one shot we can do it for you and we can do it cro and we can do it whatever you you want but you know, we kind of break even on our websites. So it's like, we're only doing it because 
we need you need a good website and you just can't find anyone else we're not trying to charge too much on those services but yeah so back in the day i think like seo is something that again like we still do a little bit of as well um and again it's just trying to make sure that the client needs it and they're probably understanding what they're what they're buying when they get seo i think that there's a lot of confusion around that industry <laughs> yeah um so I think the main thing is like we try to funnel people in the stuff that we think is going to be most effective for them. Mm. I'd say your competitive advantage, like I said earlier, is, is performance marketing. I, I was always curious why um, you didn't niche down further to just say pure social. And, and it sort of seems like that was mainly because what you wanted to do was get results and there were, were, were sort of supporting services that, that needed to help do that, like email or um, CRO services or elements of web design. It, was that primarily the reason why you didn't niche down further to just a pure play social agency? Totally. Yeah, totally. And I, I think like, um, you know, one thing that we're thinking about building is, you know, what we're internally calling Megaphone Pro, which is you get a team of people, you get a creative team that's making photos and videos for you, you get copywriters running copy, you get a media buyer, and you get a CRO team making split testing, and then you get an email team, and you get that all in one, and it's expensive, and we take a percentage of revenue. But I think that those are kind of the basic tenets to go from zero to 50 million or whatever it is in e-commerce. And so I think that that's kind of like the bare bones of like what a lot of businesses need to really kind of skyrocket their business. And then there's all these supplementary services, if you're going well, that are nice to have. You know, we can, like the app brand and Taboola and the, yeah, uh, and the influencer and, and all that stuff. And if you make that channel work and it, maybe that could be a core channel, you know, that's amazing uh, if you can find that stuff to work. But, you know, the stuff that I kind of just mentioned, that's usually the, the, the bread and butter of, you know, the zero to whatever it is, even 20 million. Um, and so I think that because of that, I think that we needed to have at least a strong offering in all of those um, core services if we want to be, you know, a one-stop shop for people that are trying to scale an e-com business, for example. Mm. I, I, I found your go-to-market really interesting because it sort of, it really, like I had this full realization when I was doing this uh, research. It's like, like he really, like he, he understood what the new channels were way back, you know, sort of 12, 13, uh, maybe 2014. And you use them yourself as ways to find new customers, which in the early days, like you said, people would have had um, second thoughts about sort of the similar thing that's happened with TikTok these days. People are still very unaware as to what is happening and it's still a naive platform in comparison. But that over time would have basically built you guys up to being number one on Clutch because you'd invested and, and niched down on that in particular. I was curious how has your go-to-market strategy changed from those early days where obviously it's just you, you know, you do the lead generation and the sales and everything to, to how does it look more now? Is it more inbound? Is it more outbound? Um, what, what does that look like for you guys as the agency as well matures outside of just leaning on you? I mean, you're, you're there one day a week, right? So how has that changed? Yeah, in terms of our like lead generation strategy. Yeah, go to market generally. Yeah, yeah. so I think um, we have a pretty good distribution between all channels. So we're, we're pretty aggressive on Facebook, Instagram, and Google and YouTube, just as advertising. Um, we do have an outbound strategy as well, where we look at, you know, we analyze a few brands that we think that we can outperform their current ad strategy and then we might reach out to them directly within a bit of an analysis on what we kind of see from what they're currently running. Um, we've got, you know, obviously referrals, search. And then, like you said, we've, we've got a top position from like the Manifest, Clutch, a few different um, uh, organizations that rank agencies. Mm. And that is a flow of leads as well. It's pretty impressive when you go on those uh, reviews. You, you must have pushed people in the early days just to go automatically give you a review, right? I think like if you rewind um, going back, it's like there's, there's sharks in the digital marketing industry. There's people that are, um, yeah. you know, aggressive in, in many ways. And as a result, um, there's 
you know, sometimes people that are a little bit untrusting when it comes to digital marketing agency, you know, we had a, we had someone that copied our website completely, use all of our stats, whatever. Um, so there's people that, you know, are bending the truth as well in their marketing. And when there's so many people that it, it, there's some level of unregulation when it comes to people's mm. marketing. And when it comes to all of that, then you need to think about how you can position yourself as authentic and trusted within that space. And so very early on, it's like, we need to get reviews. And so when a client's doing well, it, it really is helpful to say like, you know, even just to say exactly that, it's like, hey, this is a very crowded space and there's a lot of people that aren't doing well. And it's, it's really important for us if you can leave a review or even framing up the conversation from when they sign on. It's like, cool, if we hit this goal of yours, if we, if we do double your business in the next six months, are you comfortable leaving a review? Are you comfortable doing a video testimonial for us? Framing it from the start and people know that that could be an expectation of them if they do work for us, that we are going to ask for it down the line because, um, you know, I think we've got whatever it is, 130 Google reviews and 50 clutch reviews. And we, you know, we're actually just having a manager's meeting today. And we're like, why don't we have, you know, double this? Because mm -hmm. we've got 300 clients right now. It's like, we should, we should, we should have 300 reviews. So it is a really important thing. And back when I was doing it, every single one of my clients would leave a review. And now obviously it's just about trying to, properly explain to the company why it's really important um and then the other element to, to that is of is uh, awards as well so it can be they can be a, i think the awards in this industry are a little really odd as well because <laughs> yeah you know this i every now and then i get an email saying hey pay five thousand dollars and you can pretend that you've won this apac official award yeah you know and i was like well that's just a scam like you're trying to get me to pay for an award um but there are some more legit ones like tostra business award there was a uh, award for like customer service where they call up like 10 of your customers and interview them. So there's some awards like that. And by entering and, and winning those awards, again, it's just trying to position yourself as authentic or as much as you can, at least give the perception as authenticity when, because people won't know until they've actually used you. But it, I think that that's a challenge for, for these businesses. And it's something that you constantly need to think about how you can address. You've had nearly 10 years in the in agency land now. Before we get into Sylvia, I, I'm curious, you know, you, you've experienced all the blood, sweat and tears that goes into grinding out a, a services business. Um, looking back, if you had to start with nothing, which specialty would you choose? Um, which direction would you take? What would you do differently? Yeah, I think the way that we did it, you know, I think Facebook ads was a good one to double down on because if you look at, you know, all the billion dollar e-com brands that have started in the last 10 years or five years, their core channel for their first 100 million was Facebook. Um, even now, a lot of the big brands that are really winning, they've got a really good social strategy. So I still think that that was the winning strategy. I think there was only, there was only the knowledge that I had, you know, is it's easier to spend $5,000 a month than it is to spend $5 million a month. And so if I was studying today and I had all my knowledge, I probably would, probably would focus on really big clients right off the start and do some level of ad spend or rev share or, and do a little bit more of a holistic service just so that we could move really fast. Mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of agencies that I look up to in terms of what they're doing in terms of a performance level. Um, and I don't, have you ever heard of Sugaton? I think I might yeah, have yeah, mentioned yeah. it to the other. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I've become friends with um, one of the owners uh, and I really look up to what they're doing in the marketing space. Um, you know, there's another guy, Ad Kings, Darius. And so I've become friends with all these guys and they've got, um, you know, Sugaton's got a hundred staff and they've got like 20 clients. You know, we've got a hundred staff and 300 clients. So different business model, but they've grown, they can grow faster in that model. Um, and, but you just have to be better at what you're doing. So I do think that there's something to their strategy. If I was starting again, maybe looking at just getting some big clients that are really aggressive and, and taking a cut of that growth. Yeah. So that was saying that they, um, David Baker spoke in that book is that, you know, we're in a creative field and a lot of digital agencies or performance agencies got sucked into the belief that you need to price a certain way because that was what was happening with SaaS products. Maybe that's an hourly rate. Maybe that's a package rate based on outputs or maybe it's a performance rate. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I think that's less of a thing that is, I think it's a newer idea that has hit the industry is, is aligning with performance a bit better. Um, and, you know, if you're confident in the work that you can do, if your base costs are covered, then the upside is monumental. You know, there's far more scale on that. For, for this sort of business. 
Um, totally. What hasn't changed in this business at all in the last eight years? I think like the, the fundamentals of business are like always there, which is like you need to have an amazing culture. You need to hire the best staff available, um, you know, on the, on the paid side of things like good creative always wins, you know, funnels is still a thing. Like, yeah, I think a lot of the fundamentals um, are marketing fundamentals that or business fundamentals that will always hold. Um, it's, it, it's just always that gradual evolution. Mm. So uh, Sylvie, um, the foundation of it is quite interesting. I mean, um, you would assume for yourself as an agency owner, the obvious avenue to expand would be vertically and not, horizontally into a product business. So today, Sylvie, the products include a pillowcase and a face mask. It's all about um, bacteria and and facial wellness, essentially. Um, I don't know what the high level idea is. I think it's sort of um, uh, sleep health, which is sort of maybe what you're starting to, to direct towards. But um, you know, the, the marketing, of course, is just like you're fucking all over it. Reviews, comparisons, comparison SEO, the FAQs, the influencers, everything is like flawless in that regard. And so I'm curious from a product point of, point of view, why, Sylvie, why get into this area as a challenge? Yeah. So firstly, like one thing just about me is like, I always want to start businesses and I have to like slap my hand whenever I'm about to start another business go, no. Um, and I've had to do that for many years. Um, but now I think with like COVID as well, um, it was a chance to just go, I'm stuck around. I've got extra time with Sylvie. Uh, for one, I think it's a product that me and my business partner are really excited about. Like, um, so, you know, the core benefit is like it can help with acne and a lot of acne is caused by just sleeping on your pillowcase. Um, and our ultimate vision is to be the leading brand when it comes to like materials enhanced for your skin. So anything that touches your skin, you know, whether it's your t-shirt or your, you know, your socks or whatever, can it be better for your skin? Can it be more breathable? Can it be more antibacterial? Um, so like we've been working on a towel for 10 months um, and it'll probably take us another cool. six months. We do. Yeah. We, and you know, it's going to be a really good towel. And it's like, it seems so random to be like, well, it's just a towel, but it's like, yeah, but, uh, you know, the towels, they hold a lot of moisture, like they hold a ton of bacteria. Um, and when you're rubbing that on your body, um, how, how frequently are you needing to clean your towels? And so it's like, we can address this product with a more premium and product. I think it also plays into like the minimalism movement, which is like, you don't need to have, it, you can be a less consumerist and have less, but have less is more kind of have something that's going to last longer. You're going to have to wash it less. It's going to be a high quality product. Um, yeah, yeah. So we started with the pillowcase. Wow. Yeah. So that's a sort of similar thing that's happened with, um, so we, we interviewed this guy, Justin from AgriWeb earlier and, and, and how the next shape of sort of um, human tech, like technology that improves humans and, and their experience is efficiencies, like you said. Um, for him, it's around farming and how can we yield more uh, food for the world on the same or less amount of land? Um, while also reducing emissions in the process. Um, so it's I, I'm totally fascinated by products that do that. And I think D2C products are amazing at that because they cut out a lot of middlemen. You know, the digital element has helped them cut out a lot of middlemen, which saves them just costs across the board. So it's it's intriguing to hear you say it's about it's sort of more of a materials science play more than anything, if you think about it. And it makes me wonder totally. what what else is sort of brewing in your head around products. Yeah, I mean, we've got a massive product timeline. Um, we've now got a team of uh, four people in Melbourne as well. Like, we're, you know, we're quite serious about building this into something big and interesting. And and like you said, it's it's really cool to have just no constraints when it comes to marketing. It's like, you know, we've we've, re we've redesigned the branding. We're redoing the website. Um, we 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 put up 150 ads every month. Um, so the volume of creatives that we can test, we're building our own little studio to put up our own creative, you know, so like all of these like cool things that we get to do for clients on a budget, we get to do and just spend as we choose, because if we can see the profitability, you know, we can track the metrics, then we can push it as hard as we want. Um, and so in some sense, it's like the ultimate case study for Megafine. 
if we can take this company and turn it to yeah. you know, hundred million a year, then um, it'll be like, well, Megaphone can clearly do it. Um, and you know, obviously there's other factors at play like product market fit and you know, the team that's uh, helping it, but it is kind of the ultimate case study. Um, it's, it, is, it is really fun for me. And it is a product that I like, you know, we're thinking now about how we can have a mission behind the company as well. Cause I am getting to that point in my life where it's like to work another five, six years on a business or whatever it's going to be, I need to have something that's bigger than just growth opportunities and, and a really cool product and whatever. So we're, we're thinking about that, but yeah, it is something that I'm, I'm really enjoying the project. Um, and I'm enjoying, yeah, I also enjoy thinking about e-commerce and, logistics and supply chain and payment terms and product development and lab testing. And all, these are things that I've never thought of before. Um, and it is kind of a fun new challenge to think through these problems and try to solve them. It's uh, fascinating to me when you speak about um, having a business that will excite you enough to work on it for the next five, 10 years, let's say, which, um, you know, is something I've noticed about your personality and something similar I have um, in that being open and creative while also conscientious, you know, is a tricky thing. So the openness, you're always open to try and do projects. And there is a downside to that though, and that it can become distracting. And I've only really found one thing in my life so far that that I could say with certainty I would do for the rest of my life. And that is this podcast simply because it gives me that avenue to do that. How do you sort of curb that? And how do you think, of, have you ever thought about something that you know that you could do for the rest of your life or, or does it just not interest you? I, I mean, it definitely interests me. Um, yeah. I mean, we haven't spoken about my YouTube channel, but obviously yeah. I, for three years, I just learned something new every month. Um, and that was just a very big, like curiosity, just <laughs> bouncing in all different directions. Um, I'd say like a few things. One is I've definitely noticed that anything more than three major projects. And then I just start to like shut down and just get overwhelmed. And, you know, probably two is the sweet spot really. Um, and yeah, so I think that that's one thing. Another thing is like I've always looked at my business, uh, sorry, my life in stages. So like my 20s was more about just learning as much about business, growing, building something, you know, with a, a good culture and I'm proud of, but it was more about, you know, just the enjoyment of business. Um, and then in my 30s, I was meant to go on my little spiritual enlightenment journey, which got <laughs> cut by, um, by COVID, but I was meant to like move to America and travel around the world and, you know, go to different retreats and all of this kind of stuff. And um, work on just more more introspection and and whatever it is, and then mid thirties is just build something bigger, more scalable. Take what I've learned um, and see if I can build it bigger. And then forties was like focus on like giving back to the world and some level of um, alignment to like my deepest missions. And hopefully at that point, I know myself really well, I know business really well, and there can be an alignment to something really big. And that was kind of always my life plan. Um, you know, obviously things don't go perfectly to plan, but now as I am in my thirties and building this business, um, I am finding that it's like, if I'm going to give it five plus years of my time, it just, ha it has to be more than just growing a really big business for me. And mm. so I'm, I'm, tr I'm trying to figure out, cause I am really excited about, you know, all the things that I'm doing, but you know, and we donate money here and there and we, and you know, there's some cool stuff that we do, but I am trying to figure out how it, there can be some big alignment to something that kind of makes me feel a little bit more excited about the mission between behind the company. Yeah. I mean, on your YouTube channel, it's quite obvious. Um, like I said, other interviews, people would point to as the Aussie Tim Ferriss. You are quite a voracious learner, but also have me think about the opposite. How does he become uh, a voracious teacher at some point in his life, which is probably where you're, you're thinking about the giving back component. Uh, do you, do you see things like family and kids as something you want to have? in your life? Because I, 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 it'd be fascinating to see you as a father. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd love to be a father. Um, I think, you know, I've got this one. I'm, so I'm moving to America in six weeks, assuming that I can get my travel exemption. And I think when I come back at that point, I'll be a little bit more like I've spread my wings and now I can settle down a little bit. But yeah, I'd love to be a father. I think I still, um, I don't know if you feel like this too, but I still feel in so many ways childlike. Um, <laughs> And I, I hope in the good ways and not the bad ways. 
Um, but even with a chart, I feel like I can connect to the level and kind of, you know, just playing games and exploring and, 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 and so to have a little you to kind of do that with, I think would be pretty awesome. Yeah. You know, I, I, I've got similar mindset. Um, I can't wait to have kids with my wife. I think, um, like for me, I'm not very, um, I, I don't get stuck in a lot of the politics and social elements of life. It's never really like being social interests me, but that's more from like a learning about things, learning about people, discussions, all that sort of stuff. I've never been a, you know, the, the facade that sort of pervades us as we hit that, those teenage years has never really interest, interested me. And that's why I always find kids utterly fascinating. But that also could be because I grew up in a Greek family. You've got lots of kids running around. You sort of have to become used to that. But yeah, there, there is something about a childlike view of the world that to me is just very innate and um, would, would be fascinating, I think. And to, to inform that child as well would be fascinating, you know, because yeah. you sort of become a mirror onto yourself in a way. And how does that affect them without you realizing? So, um, yeah, it'd be, it'd be very, very interesting. You, you do, you've done a few of these interviews now. Um, there's always the typical questions that you get all the time. What's the one topic that you wish people would ask you about more? It's a good question. Um, I, I think, uh, I mean, sometimes when I'm listening to interviews with someone like a Ray Dalio or, or Tim Ferriss or, or we might, someone that I look up to, not saying that people look up to me, but I'm always curious to know, um, they have such an Ill analytical and interesting like framework approaching life. So I'm curious to know how that, fo that focuses on other important modalities, for example, like happiness, relationships, health, which are all things that I like to think deeply on. Yeah. It sort of sounds like uh, you wish people would ask you more about things other than business. Well, I think for the context of the interview, I totally get it. But I think when I'm listening to other people, uh, I guess I'm, you know, I'm really interested if I'm like, oh, this person is really good about business. I wonder how they're approaching dating. I wonder how they're approaching yeah, you know, yeah. their health optimization strategy because they've just got a good framework um, for thinking through life. So, yeah. um, but then for the purpose of this podcast, I'm not sure if people, are, if they're here for business and maybe they want to hear a, a relationship expert or a health expert talk about that stuff. So maybe that yeah. makes sense. Well, it's, it, it's definitely a good point because I try and, you know, the fact that people pester me about saying, I wish you asked more business questions or more life questions is a good thing for me. I, I like that it polarizes people either way. Um, but I agree. There's so many interviews you listen to and you get no questions about like their childhood, their personal life or any, it doesn't become a real conversation. It becomes very PR driven. So mm. um, I think it's a very good point. Very, very good point. Um, but rapid fire questions to finish things off. Uh, morning and evening routine. What's that look like? Uh, it flows. Uh, right now, relatively minimal. I'm doing a six weeks detox of caffeine, YouTube, alcohol, games, wow. um, and a bunch of other things. So um, I listen to a lot of podcasts and audiobooks in the morning and at night. That's that's usually what I'm doing. Maybe read my little daily. I've got like a little vision board kind of thing that I have that I look at as well. Okay. And what about evening? What are you doing at night? Yeah, usually just listening to podcasts and, and audiobooks. Yeah. So you don't watch much TV or anything like that? Well, when I'm not doing a detox, I obsessively watch YouTube, which is why, I, for whatever reason, I love watching people play video games on YouTube. It's just it's like <laughs> so satisfying to me. And I have to ban it at a certain point because it just starts to get in the way of my sleep. What what was the game of choice in the last six months that I'm watching? Yeah, it, it's a game that came out in 1999 called Heroes Mine and Magic Three. Oh, really? Out of it? Yeah. yeah. Why you why that why why that? Um, the amount of like complexity in the decision making and just watching someone play it's like it's like I'm constantly watching someone solve a puzzle mm -hmm. and um. I actually like watching people solve puzzles as well. Um, like Chris Ramsey is a good channel as well. But for this, I just, I understand all of the rules of the game. And then to just watch someone play it in a way that I couldn't play is just 
very satisfying for me. I don't know why. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that because I remember there was um, a channel that I was watching heaps um, called Mr. Puzzle, this German guy. Yeah. And he just goes through this. Yeah. Yeah. These really complex puzzles. Um, and almost like, I think it was 2019, maybe I, I had, I went deep on sort of watching people play Fortnite. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's, it's very interesting that sort of stuff. Um, last question for you. Best purchase under $200. I think, um, I mean, it's a bit of like a easy answer, but like the AirPods Pro is ah, okay. just like, I love it. The other thing actually um, is there's a t-shirt, there's a t-shirt coming a good son of a tailor. I have like this obsession for like everything very basic, but I just want to find the best of everything. And um, when it comes to basic t-shirts, I kind of looked around the world and this is a company I think in Spain and they take your measurements and you can choose like the density of the cotton. I might've told you this when we caught up the other day. Yeah. Um, and so the t-shirts that they wear, like I have these like lightweight ones during summer and it's just a perfect fit and the, the cotton's really good. And it's like signed by the person that stitched your shirt. It's just wow. a really cool company. So what, what's the like, name of it? Yeah. Son of a tailor. Son of a tailor. I think, yeah, I think I have seen this. Son of a tailor. I feel like I've been served their ads. Yeah. Yeah. They run solid ads as well. But yeah, I just, I like everything that they do in their brand. I like their emails. I like, you know, their website. I like their products. I like their ads. You're right. So they do t-shirts, uh, short sleeves, long sleeves. They do polos as well. Yeah. Oh, long sleeve polos are really cool. Yeah. Recommended. Yeah. Cause I, I had these, um, it's actually really affordable. Because I remember I bought, I had them for years, um, these shirts from Coz, and um, they fitted really well. It was like $90, really good quality cotton, um, but they just broke recently. And I, t- I took them to like a tailor to get fixed up, but I just know that it's just not going to be the same. So maybe this yeah. is my fix. Maybe. There you go. Um, Max, thank you so much for coming in. I know you've got a busy day ahead, but um, where can people find you on the interwebs? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn at Max Hedden or Instagram at Max Hedden, probably the best two places. Awesome. Max, thanks for coming on the show. My absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for checking out this episode. If you do like it, please subscribe. And of course, like if you're watching the YouTube video as well. Uh, We'd really appreciate that. You can also find our Clips channel in the description. For audio, if you're not already listening, you can search Uncommon on Pocket Cast, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts quite easily. For video, if you're not watching, you can search Uncommon on YouTube. And for behind-the-scenes takes and clips uh, on social media, then definitely check out at Uncommon underscore show on Instagram. But otherwise, look, thanks so much for tuning in. And until next time, thanks for listening.